Part 1 You and a friend are looking for a place to live. You have a list of places and go to see a rental agent to check on a number of points. Listen to the conversation between your friend and the rental agent and complete the list. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hi, we've been looking over your listing of apartments for rent and we have a few questions about a couple of the apartments. Can you help us? Sure. Yep, yeah, this is our most recent listing. What would you like to know? Well, we were first wondering about the house on 3rd Street. We can see that it is furnished and rents for $135 a week, but can you tell us how many bedrooms it has? Let's see. In addition to the den, it has three bedrooms. The rental on 3rd Street has three bedrooms. So in the example, three bedrooms has been written down in the number of rooms column for 19 3rd Street. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hi, we've been looking over your listing of apartments for rent, and we have a few questions about a couple of the apartments. Can you help us? Sure. Yep, yeah, this is our most recent listing. What would you like to know? Well, we were first wondering about the house on 3rd Street. We can see that it is furnished and rents for $135 a week, but can you tell us how many bedrooms it has? Let's see. In addition to the den, it has three bedrooms. What about the one on Route 9N? It looks like it's big with a library and a deck, but it doesn't say how much it costs or anything else about it. Oh yes, Mrs Gaylor's apartment. That one is actually only a 10-month rental and it is going for $156 per week. It's quite a nice place. She only rents for 10 months each year because of horse racing season. Then her relatives all come to stay, so tenants have to move out. It's a little bit inconvenient, but past tenants have really enjoyed their stay there. Oh, well, we need it for a full year. I guess that one is out. How about the rental on Broen Drive? How many rooms does that one have? As it says on the list, it has two bedrooms and a private kitchen and bath. But it's actually a very small place. That's why it's a bit cheaper. Oh. Well then, what about the one that has three large rooms? Who is renting that property? That one is a good deal. Mr John Smith is renting it. But he's quite eccentric and he has a strict rule about no pets. How about cats? Nope. Absolutely no pets. Hmm. Well then, how about this studio apartment rented by Mr Bo Jensen? How is that one? That ad is actually a bit deceptive. The studio apartment is the whole upper floor of an older house. It's actually very large and, at $45 a week, quite affordable. And it's near campus. I think I'd like to check that one out. Do you have a telephone number that we can call? It's not on the list? Oh, it isn't. Here it is. You should ring area code 518 and then 543-7790. Thanks. I think I'll call on that one first. Your friend decides that he would like to talk to Mr. Bo Jensen. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10.
Hello? 1512, Route 9. Yes. Is this Mr. Jensen? Yes, it is. Can I help you? Yeah. We're studying here at university, and we came across the rental information for the studio apartment that you are renting. Is it still available? Yes, of course. I actually just placed the ad, and you're the first person to call. Is there anything you'd like to know about it? Yes, actually, there is. As students, we are on the Internet a lot, and we heard that some homes in the area have high-speed connections. What type of connection do you have there now? Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting first question. But I guess I have heard that too. But we just have a phone line here. Nothing fancy. I think you can have a cable line installed, but it's just a phone line for now. OK. Well, maybe we can do that. What type of heating does the apartment have? Now, there's a more traditional question. We have oil heat here. It's an older house. That tends to be a little more expensive during the winter, right? Yeah, but there's nothing to do about it. It would cost too much for me to put in a gas heater. What else would you like to know about the apartment? Well, we heard it was quite big. Is it furnished? Actually, yes. I should have put that in the ad. It has an old couch and a couple chairs, a dining table, refrigerator, stove, and even a dishwasher. Does it have any beds? Yep, it has two. That sounds great. When is the apartment available? You can have it tomorrow night if you want. I just have to clean up a couple things before you get here. Do you want to come over and see it first? No, it sounds fine to us. I actually know the street too, so I know the area. We'll take it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Listen to a man talking to a group of people at a weekend work conference in a hotel. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. OK, can everyone listen again now, please? Now you know how much of the weekend will be work and what some of the meetings and sessions are about, I'd like to tell you something about how you can spend some of the free time you have over the weekend, both inside the hotel and outside in the town centre. As I've said, you'll be free from around five today and on Saturday and from lunchtime on Sunday and there's plenty to do. This is the first time we've had the conference at the Royal Spa Hotel and I'm sure you'll agree it's a very nice place. Really, there's no need to leave the hotel at all if you don't want to, but I'm sure some of you will want to get out for a change of environment. OK, first, restaurants and bars. I'm sure you all saw that there was a bar near the entrance as you came into the hotel, but there are actually two more bars. One is also on the ground floor, behind the main restaurant, and the other is on the top floor. That one has a very nice terrace where you can sit outside and enjoy the view. That bar is for hotel guests only and is usually a bit quieter. As I say, the main restaurant is on the ground floor. We will have breakfast and lunch there, so you'll get to know it well. 
There is also a smaller restaurant for coffee, sandwiches, and snacks on the third floor, and that is also only for hotel guests. There is a gym and health club in the basement. The gym has a good range of equipment and is open from 7 a.m. I know some of you were talking about a swimming pool, but unfortunately there is no swimming pool. I will tell you where there is a pool close to the hotel in a moment. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Now, I hope to see some of you around the hotel over the weekend, but I'm sure you will want to get out and see the town at some point. If you'd like to look at the map on the screen, I'll show the area around the hotel. There is a map of the town centre in your welcome pack, too. OK, a y you can see the hotel here, in the middle of the map. And the main entrance here at the top in Carlisle Street. OK, a y that swimming pool I promised to tell you about is here in Cromwell Road. If you turn right out of the hotel, it's about 10 minutes up the road in the third street on the left. It's open until 7 pm and until 5 on Sunday. There's a very nice park here to the north, again about 10 minutes away. In the middle of the park is a boating lake, so if the weather's good on Sunday, it might be a nice way to relax. If you want to see a movie this evening or on Saturday night, the cinema is here in the High Street. Come out of the hotel and turn left. The High Street is only three minutes away. The cinema is here at the top of the street next to a fairly large car park. Now, Restaurants. There is a good Chinese restaurant in the middle of the high street, here on the right. It's directly opposite the town hall. It's called the White Orchid. Another very nice restaurant is Leonardo's. It does Spanish and Mexican food. It's here at the bottom of the high street. So, turn left at the end of Carlisle Street, walk down for five minutes. And you'll see it on the other side of the road. I went to Leonardo's last time I was here, so I can recommend it. Now, if anyone wants to see some live music, there is always a jazz band playing at the Pink Coconut. <laughs> yeah, that's right, the Pink Coconut. That's here in a little street behind the hotel. The street name is not on the map, but it's easy to find. Turn right out of the main entrance and then take the first right to go back round to the back of the hotel. So, I think that's everything. Please ask me if you have anything else. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Three, part three. You will hear a tutor and some students talking about an assignment. Listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six.
Come in. Sit down. Good to see you. Hello. Hello. Now, this assignment. The best thing we can do, I think, is to think how we can approach it. The main point is to investigate television, but not what's happened in the past. I was thinking that it would be necessary to go over the new media first mm. and then... Yes, that's a way to make a start, but you need to do that quite briefly. But it's quite a complex topic. That... Yeah, I agree, but the emphasis must be on the future development of television as a cultural phenomenon. Yes. I've been reading the talk by Ashley Highfield. All right, and what do you take from that? What are the things that are competing with television? Well, to start with, there is the games console, then there is the personal computer and the internet, um, then again the mobile phone with its capability of games and puzzles, mm. um, and of course internet access. Lastly, there is the iPod with the possibility of listening to music wherever you go. Good, you've understood that. Now, which of these presents the greatest competition for television? Well, according to the research, it's video games. Yes, that's true at present. But in the future... I think the phone will present the greatest threat then. And why? Because it's mobile, portable and it's developing fast. Yeah, I think you're right. You need always to look to the future and try to assess how things will develop, as we said. Good. Now, you need to move on to the new social trends in connection with television. Is one of them the idea that programmes might become shorter and shorter? Ah, yes. The, the average programme might be ten minutes. Or even less. Just mini programmes, say, four to five minutes long. Now, do you think you can get access to all the materials you need? The problem at the moment is the library. Oh, yes. What's happening there? There's a tremendous amount of noise because of the new extension they are building. It's quite impossible to work there. They are stopping work for a week next week, I believe, and then all the sections will be open. There's a hold-up because some roof tiles have not arrived, so there'll be peace for that week. But then after that, the media studies section will be closed for a week and all the noise and dirt will start up again. Yes, the sociology section will be open and there's some good stuff there for you on this topic and it's further away from the noise. Mm. Yes, I don't think the sociology section is affected at all and neither is the journal section. No. Obviously, they're rotating the closures, and it was sociology's turn to close for a week last term. I think we should make a complaint. Yeah, I think you should. I've had a word with the library staff. They are very sympathetic, but... Well, they are affected by these works just as we are. If I were you, I'd make a complaint directly to the premises committee. They only meet once a year, but in fact, I know they're having a meeting next Tuesday. You might like to make contact with them, but don't say that I suggested this. <laughs> yes. The students' union might be better since they are independent of the university. That's true, but I can't imagine that people haven't already approached them about this. Mm. Let's try the premises committee. Good idea. Why not? OK. Now, don't forget I need a copy of your dissertations by email and two copies in print, that is, on paper. If you give the Reprographics office 24 hours' notice, they'll make copies for you. And if you give them my details, they'll send those copies directly to me. They won't send copies to you, so you'll need to take your own copy personally from them. Good. Any questions? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now answer questions 27 to 30. One little thing was just that I wondered whether we should actually talk about that famous website. You know the one, YouTube. Ah, I was rather hoping you hadn't overlooked that. <sighs> Good point. It's mostly homemade videos. I suppose you could say that each video is a television version of a podcast. Anything else? Yes, I've got a question, I'm afraid. I'm not completely clear about the exact meaning of culture as we are using it in this subject. Well, Mrs Jones is giving a lecture on culture and society in the University Theatre. It's on Wednesday at 10am, and you can learn all about it there, I'm sure. Can you give us that again, please? Yes, that's Culture and Society. It's in the University Theatre. And um, let me just check the time.
Yes, here it is. 10 a.m. on Wednesday. She'll be giving a very thorough discussion of the issues in defining what culture means. Right. That's good. Uh, the thing is, the reading list confused me a bit. One thing that occurred to me was that it might be broken down into subsections for future students. Yes, that's a fair point. I'll bear that in mind. Now, don't forget, you need to do the reading and finish the assignment by the 4th of July. Is that OK? Fine. Thank you very much. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture about the geographic information about Australia. You now have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40 by choosing the best answers from the choices. Good morning, everybody. We'll continue to look at Australia and today look at one of its greatest natural challenges, water for the agricultural sector. As the only nation to occupy an entire continent, Australia has a unique environment with much of it very flat and dry. One notable feature of the Australian continent is that it is the lowest of the continents. The average elevation is less than 300 metres, compared with the world's mean of 700 metres, and its highest mountain is only 2,228 metres, so it is overall a very flat country. It is also dry. In fact, Australia is the driest, after Antarctica, of the continents. Yet, Australia has extremes of climate and topography. There are rainforests and vast plains in the north, snowfields in the southeast, deserts in the centre, and fertile croplands in the east, south, and southwest. And Australia contains some of the wettest areas on Earth. In western Tasmania and on the northern Queensland coast, but half of the continent has an annual rainfall of less than 300 millimetres each year, and only 20% has more than 600 millimetres each year. A major problem is that the limited water resources do not match up with where water is consumed. The major water resources are in northern Australia and Tasmania, whereas most of the agriculture and people are in southeastern mainland Australia. The agricultural sector is the largest consumer of both self extracted and main supplied water, using over 70% of total net water consumption. Electricity and gas supply and water sewerage and drainage services use notable amounts of self-extracted water. However, net consumption in the household sector is the lowest, just 8% of total net water used. Australia's water use increased by 25% over the decade between the mid-1980s 
and mid-1990s. Much of this increase was due to irrigated agriculture, which, as noted earlier, accounts for over 70% of national water demand. Since the mid-1990s, the growth and profitability of irrigated agriculture has outstripped the dryland agriculture sector. Irrigated commodities contributed almost a third of total farm exports in the mid-1990s. The results of a special government report in 2000 showed that if today's water use arrangements continue, the water needs of the rural industries will outstrip water availability by about 2020. Irrigated agriculture, Australia's major water using sector, would be seriously affected by the shortwall. And although groundwater underlies large areas of Australia, it accounts for only 4% of water use. So, clearly, apart from water for households, which mainly comes from dams or rivers, it is the rural sector where efforts towards water conservation are particularly directed. In this sector, the largest consumers of water are the meat and wool industries. One of the major problems in considering sustainable agriculture is the large amount of irrigated water used to produce these products. Some of the crops, such as wheat, maize and soybeans, also use a lot of water. Furthermore, many crops are grown in dry areas where up to half the available water evaporates from the soil surface or seeps down too low into the ground for the plant roots to reach it. Well, that's all we have time for this morning. You will be able to do further study on this topic in the library, and I have a handout here with references for those who want to come out to the front to collect it. Next week, we'll look at outback farming and that is the end of part four you now have half a minute to check your answers